town for a while in Ohio uh, with snow and all. So we're glad that you folks are back in church with us. We miss you when you're gone. Do be in prayer for uh, Bill Brazel, who has been in intensive care for weeks and weeks now and is on the critical list. He is not getting better, but he's giving a, according to me, he's been giving a real clear testimony that he knows the Lord is his Savior and has been an effective in the life of his family. Continue to pray for Bill and for Betty. I want to read my text this morning in its entirety without you looking at your Bibles because I'm reading from the Living Bible and then I want to turn to the NIV for the comments on the subject. But it's a story that if you can just tear yourselves away from whatever is so important in your thinking this morning, and listen to this story, I think it will be interesting to you. It's not new altogether, but hopefully we'll learn some new principles by it that will help us in our lives. And that's what the Bible is for when we study the lives of other people. You remember what was said in the New Testament? These things were written for our ensamples upon whom the ends of the world have come. The end of the world is coming upon us, and we're looking back for examples or in samples as the Old Testament, Old English word is, to give us guidance and direction on how we should live in these days. <clears throat> when Joseph arrived in Egypt as a captive of the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased <clears throat> from them by Potiphar, a member of the personal staff of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now this man, Potiphar, was the captain of the king's bodyguard and his chief executioner. The Lord greatly blessed Joseph there in the home of his master so that everything he did succeeded. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph in a very special way. So Joseph naturally became quite a favorite with him. Soon he was put in charge of the administration of Potiphar's household and all his business affairs. At once the Lord began blessing Potiphar for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs began to run smoothly. His crops flourished and his flocks multiplied. So Potiphar gave Joseph the complete administration responsibility over everything he owned. He had no worry in the world with Joseph there except to decide what he wanted to eat. Joseph, by the way, was a very handsome young man. One day about this time, Potiphar's wife began making eyes at Joseph and suggested that he come and sleep with her. Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in the entire household. He himself has no more authority here than I have. He has held back nothing from me except you yourself because you are his wife. How can I do such a wicked thing as this? It would be against God day after day even though he refused to listen and kept out of her way as much as he could then one day as he was in the house going about his work as it happened no one else was around at the time she came and grabbed him by the sleeve demanding sleep with me he tore himself away but as he did his jacket slipped off and she was left holding it as he fled from the house when she saw that she had his jacket and that he had fled she began screaming, and when the other men around the place came running in to see what had happened, she was crying hysterically. My husband had to bring in this Hebrew slave to insult us, she sobbed. He tried to rape me, but when I screamed, he ran and forgot to take his jacket. She kept the jacket, and when her husband came home that night, she told him her story. That Hebrew slave you had around here tried to rape me, and I was only saved by my screams. He fled, leaving his jacket behind. Well, when her husband heard his wife's story, he was furious. He threw Joseph into the prison where the king's prisoners were kept in chains. But the Lord was with Joseph there too and was kind to him by granting him favor with the chief jailer. In fact, the jailer soon handed over the entire prison administration to Joseph so that all the other prisoners were responsible to him. The chief jailer had no more worries after that, for Joseph took care of everything, and the Lord was with him, so that everything ran smoothly and well. A chapter out of the life of Joseph. Let's 
stop for prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We don't thank you for everything that happened in it. We understand that not everything in it that happened is good, nor do you put your sanction upon everything that people did, even your own people. But you didn't hold back and just tell a good story. You told it all. And you said you told it so that we could learn from it. And we pray that you'd help us to do that this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just happened to think and wanted to say, but forgot to a moment ago, in connection with what Lou said to you about God's faithfulness in the past year, how many of those fears that you had in the last year, those worries about terrible things that were going to happen, how many of them came true? Most of them did. You see, we tax ourselves so badly all year long, and we get to the end of the year and look back. Most of the things that we worried about, most of the things that we feared would come to pass, didn't. And I give God the credit for that. And he says, don't worry, I'll be with you. He was with Joseph. I grew up <clears throat> in the late 40s and early 50s, and those were called the happy days by some people in our days. Happy because it seemed to be a carefree type of uh, time in history. Although it was not completely carefree, perhaps in some respects it was in relationship to what young people are facing today. It was a different era, and we won't bore you with all of the details of those archaic times of the 50s. But something else that I grew up with, and a lot of you did, was a little rhyme that went like this. What are little girls made of? Sugar and spice and everything nice. That's what little girls are made of. What are little boys made of? Snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. That's what little boys are made of. Now, what do you think a psychologist would say about that kind of <laughs> feeding to the hearts and minds of young people? Well, that's kind of how we felt back in the 50s. We thought it was just us boys that had bad thoughts and that girls were just sugar and spice and everything nice. But we've learned today that it works both ways. And I'm not sure, but what there has been a change, that it used to be somewhat different. I feel like it was. And girls have been sold a bill of goods that they ought to be made out of snakes and snails and puppy dog tails too, because that's how girls act today. And what you see, and I'm not sure, but what it's done by design, by men who write the scripts, that girls are chasing boys today and women are chasing men. And it's a sad situation, but perhaps not on the wholesale scale that we see today, but it, there have always been bad girls that were made out of snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. And one of them we see today in the life of Potiphar's wife. I'm sure that Hollywood could make a complete story about the kind of lady she was or woman she was, but the Bible gives very little detail this woman who tried to seduce Joseph. And of course, inquiring minds want to know oh, just what else she did in her life. Was this the first time that she was uh, errant and wayward in her conduct? And we would have to think, well, probably not. But the Bible, see, doesn't uh, lend itself toward all of our inquisitive thinking. It gives just enough to get across the message that we need to know. How important are principles in our lives? That's the question this morning. How important are principles? I was reading an article in Dr. Dobson's Focus on the Family magazine the other day, and it was a mother speaking and telling how she learned a lesson concerning uh, honesty as a principle in her life. She was in the kitchen, make, kitchen making uh, spaghetti sauce, and her young son from the other room says, Mom, you're not putting onions in the spaghetti sauce, are you? She had them all diced and chopped, and they were in her hand. And she says, No. And she dumped the onions in the spaghetti sauce, saying, Well, you know, it's not all that important anyway. He'll never know the difference. It's just a kind of a thing he has about onions. And so she, she thought about it as being just a little, a little lie. Just a few days later, he came home with some instructions from school on what a child should do if 
uh, someone called and wanted to know uh, who was there. And uh, the instructions from the school told them, the children, to say, uh, mother's taking a bath, or dad's out in the garage, or something to let the caller know that there was some adult there to supervise the children while they were home. And the mother realized that, you know, this, this was a lie too, if the parents weren't there. But situation ethics has taught us that it's okay to lie if you have a good reason for it. And it started off real small back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, it has grown now to where it's taken over the thinking of our society. Any excuse is good enough to tell a lie if it will help you out of a, a problem. So I go back and confess that she had not been truthful altogether with her children. And to realize that uh, her principle was sliding because she thought she had a good reason for being dishonest. How important are principles? They are things that we live and die by. Joseph's life teaches us the value of right principles. And it may be that we can read this story through and not really pick up on the right principles. So if you would, I'd like you to follow me in the Pew Bible this morning. I know that you think I am uh, only a King James Version Bible person, and I am for the most part. And if you come tonight for the Firewood series, be sure to bring King James Bible because that's what I'm using. But this morning, so that you can take part more readily with me, just take a pew Bible and turn to the 39th chapter of Genesis as I bring forth something perhaps that you hadn't seen as clearly before as we'll see this morning. That Joseph, who already has suffered a lot. He had been hated by his brothers. He had been put down by his parents for the dreams that he had had and rebuked because God had chosen him for a special job in life. And nobody could understand it, and everybody was jealous and angry with Joseph, so much so that they intended to kill him, but decided rather to sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And he was taken off down into Egypt and put on the slave block and sold to Potiphar. Sold probably because he was good-looking and well-built. That's what the scripture says about him. And he was sold into the household of Potiphar, and he was made a lowly slave, which meant... He had no choices of his own. He could not go and come as he pleased. He had to do what he was told. And in a situation like this, it would not be uncommon for a person like that to develop an attitude. Now, we always, we older folks have always talked about good attitudes and bad attitudes. But today it's just, he's got an attitude. That's what young people say. And we learn to think like young people do, or at least to accept their language, which uh, changes in every generation. And so Joseph could have had an attitude. He could have been angry with his brothers. He could have been resentful against Potiphar. He could have done just as little as he could get by with, but the Bible tells us that in his duties as a lowly slave, God was with him, and he prospered in what he did. He gave himself to being a slave just as readily as he would give himself to serving the Lord. In fact, you know, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, when Paul is speaking to slaves, he says, when you do your work, when you do your job, do it as unto the Lord. And that doesn't just mean somebody who is a slave in the common understanding of the word, but it means to do your work at your job as an employee as you would not to your boss but as unto the Lord. Do your best job. And that's what Joseph did. He was at the bottom of the ladder and he did his job as unto the Lord. That's found in verse 2. The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered as he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Because he did his job well and because he did it as unto the Lord, we read in verse 4, that Joseph found favor in the eyes of his master and became his attendant. So in a sense, he got a promotion from being just a common slave, just one of many, to being an attendant to Potiphar. In other words, he was his assistant. He moved up to being assistant manager, as it were. In verse 4a, he was promoted. In verse 4b, he became ruler over Potiphar's household. 
Potiphar put him in charge of his household. He entrusted everything in his household uh, into his care. And because Joseph was, was living and working as unto the Lord, then the Lord prospered who? Potiphar. Didn't say he prospered Joseph. He says what Joseph did prospered and therefore uh, Potiphar, uh, his, whatever he had uh, prospered. It, it, uh, it gained in value. So from being a slave, he became an assistant to Potiphar. And as he did well in what he did as an assistant, he became the uh, household supervisor. He became not the assistant, but he became the supervisor over Potiphar's household. That meant the other slaves. That meant the kitchen where things were cooked. That meant the yard work, the housework, everything that goes on in a big household because Potiphar was an important man. He was right under the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he was an important man, and there a lot of things goes on in a rich household. And Joseph became the supervisor over that. And the Bible says, From the time he put him in charge of his household, and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had. And here again, I, I read here uh, another promotion for Joseph because God blessed Potiphar so much that everything was healed. Now, the first mention was that Joseph was a slave, and then he was assistant to Potiphar, and then he was over his household, which to me did not, did not say he was over the farm and the field. But now, since the field uh, became prosperous too, verse 6, we read, so he left in Joseph's care everything he had. Here's another promotion. He's not only over the household, but he's also over the farm outside the field and it's humorous to me and I'm always looking for humor because humor is so good for people it's humorous to me that the only worry Potiphar had was what huh <laughs> what he had to eat for supper <laughs> that's right and he didn't have to worry about going out and shopping for that or even having it cooked all he had to do was decide what he wanted you know, when you land up there in the hospital and they bring you the menu, and you have to mark all those things that you want. You don't have to go get it. You don't have to cook it. All you have to do is decide whether you want this for breakfast and this for lunch and this for supper. And they come in and take your menu away, and pretty soon here it comes. That's all he had to worry about. Didn't have to worry about the slaves, the farm, the harvesting, the planting, the plowing. Didn't have to worry about the cooking in the kitchen. Didn't have to worry about the making of the beds or anything. All they had to do was worry about, well, what do we have for lunch today? Or what will I have? It's funny to me. Well, that's the kind of person Joseph was. He was a cooperative person in an insulting situation. He was a slave. But because he did well, God prospered Potiphar, and Potiphar promoted Joseph from slave to assistant household supervisor to entire estate supervisor. Now, commercial break. And then we come back to the second act where it says in verse um, 7 or just before 7, now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Physical perfection can be a potential danger. There are a lot of people who are ugly, and there are a lot of people who are skinny or fat, a lot of people who are not attractive to other people, and they can be thankful, at least for one thing, that they don't run the danger that Joseph ran. You see who gets in trouble in this world today? All the Marilyn Monroes and Elvis Presleys and others that are so nice looking that they can have anything and anybody they want, and so they do. And they marry and divorce and marry and divorce and have heartache and heartbreak. And uh, it just is a snare and a trap. And if you happen to be good looking, well built, you run a danger that a lot of folks don't, just like Joseph did. Now I admit that most of us don't have that problem. But if you do, <laughs> if you do, 
don't, uh, don't make light of it because if you're not prepared, if you're not prepared, you can get in some of the biggest trouble of your life. Joseph, can you imagine? There are a lot of young people who say, boy, I'd like to be where Joseph was. Yes, sir. But Potiphar's wife made eyes at him and a proposition to him. And what did, how did he respond? He refused. That's just as simple as it is. It is very difficult, I'm sure, for a man being propositioned by a woman to refuse. But he refused, and initially when she came to him, he gave a good reason for it. Later on, he did not explain anymore. He did not try to convince her. He did not keep on giving excuses. He didn't say, I, would, I sure wish you could understand. Now, come on, let's sit down and talk about it. He didn't do it. He had one initial time when he gave a reason why he did as he did, and from then on, he tried to stay out of her way. I'm telling you, young people, adults, all of us, we can learn a valuable lesson from how Joseph handled this situation. There's been many a husband at work, in the office, on the job, many a song leader in churches, many a pastor. It's a piano because they tried to deal with something that was out of their reach. And it has brought heartache and it has brought trouble to uh, the extended situation. But Joseph, notice what Joseph said now. It is very important. It's, it's very important to know more than just to say no and to know more than just to explain what is the reason. Here it is. He said, with me in charge, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you and you're his wife. And so he said, how then could I do such a wicked thing? Now, don't read any further right now. You know what? If he lived today and if he wasn't thinking right, he would say, it would not be right for me to do this to Potiphar. He's trusted me. That's true. He would have said, it's not right for me to do this to you because you're his wife and it wouldn't be good for your marriage. He could have said, how can I do this to myself and hurt my own integrity? But is that what he said? No. And you see, that's what the world doesn't know today. It's not even a factor. You listen to any talk show, you listen to any kind of a, a debate or a panel or anything, it is all built around how it's going to affect me, how it's going to affect you, how it's going to affect somebody else. But Joseph says, how can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? See, when you sin, you sin, yeah, against her, me, other, parents, friends, family. When you sin, you sin against God at first. And this is the sad thing today that all the people of this world are not concerned, are not even taking into account the fact that sin is, first of all, against God. We don't know how to explain all that, and we don't know how to justify all that. It's just a fact. It's just true. And secondarily, secondarily, it is a sin against my own self and against somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. So what the world says, if we can figure out how this doesn't hurt anybody, we can do it, you know? If we can figure out how it doesn't hurt anybody, if he's consenting or she's consenting or if protection is used or if whatever, 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 it's okay. Do it all if you want to, but you're still sinning against God. And that's what the world needs to know, but nobody's asking the question. But you and I as Christians need to know we need to know that Joseph knew. He knew what was right. How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Well, to face a situation like this, as Joseph did, in a comfortable position as headmaster over the entire state, and to be propositioned by the master's wife, which today would be nothing, but, and to refuse is very admirable 
And this happens to people today, but you know where the danger comes? Next. It said, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Two principles here. First of all, and we're not just talking about this particular sin, but we can talk about other, you know, you can put any other sin that may be a problem to you in this same situation. It's not so hard for a principled person to the very first time say no. But when it keeps coming back, the temptation keeps coming back over and over. That's when people get worn down and finally give in. But not Joseph. Though she spoke to him day after day, he refused to do what she said. Second principle, or even be with her problem lots of people have is that they hang around their temptation too much. Joseph could have gone in and sat down and said, well, I don't want to do that, but let's just talk. We can be friends. He stayed out of her way. He stayed out, and if you, listen, if you and I have a temptation that bothers us, stay out of its way. I remember hearing the story years and years ago about this man that had a trouble with drinking, and he gave up drinking when he became a Christian, but it was such, it had such a, a, a hold on him that it was still a temptation, and wouldn't you know that between where he lived and the church house was a bar right on the corner. So he learned what to do. When he got within a few yards of the bar, he started running, and he didn't stop until he had run all the way past it and gotten close to the church house. So sometimes we have to flee, to run. We'll find that out in a moment. Because the Bible says one day, one day he went into the house to tend to his own business, is what it says. To attend to his duties inside. By now she was desperate and caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me, but he ran. He ran. And it may be young person or grown folks, you may come against a temptation sometime that is so strong that you'll just have to run. Get out of there. Leave it behind. Don't stand there and expect the Lord to give you strength to overcome this temptation. Just run. Joseph did. He ran and he left his coat, his jacket, his cloak, whatever that was, behind in her hand. By now she was so spurned that she was angry. And when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand, that uh, she thought of another plan. Let me catch up with my notes here. Let me just read a couple of things. Persistent temptation has often led people to fall into sin, but not Joseph. But to give an example of who it did, remember Samson, how he handled it? Let's compare Joseph to Samson. Samson was tempted by Delilah to reveal the secret of his great strength. He began to toy with Delilah. Oh, if you, um, you know, if you get some new ropes and tie me, I'll be as weak as any other man. So she got some ropes and tied him. I forget the order of the, the three ways. He should have known after the very first betrayal, shouldn't he, to run, but he didn't. Foolish, Samson, foolish. You'll take some new green with <laughs> whatever those are. Tie me, I'll be as weak as another man. And he got closer and closer all the time to the answer. He says, well, if you'll take my hair and weave it into a, the, the beam, into a weaver's beam, weave it in there, I'll be, I'll be weak. And they said, Samson, the Philistines are upon thee. And he jumped up and he ran off, dragging the beam with him. He should have known right then he was right on the verge of, of defeat, but he didn't. He was foolish. He was not like Joseph. His heart was not after God like Joseph's was and finally he says well okay it said that it came to pass that as he wearied her with wearied him with her questions day after day he just said well if you cut my hair off I'll be weak like a woman and went to sleep she got him drunk and went to sleep and that was it that was essentially the end of his life except for the finale where when his head hair grew back he killed everybody including himself but not Joseph Joseph ran he did not toy with his temptation he left it behind. Another thing we need to uh, to.
to realize is this. Minding one's own business does not always deliver a temptation. Joseph went in the house, taking care of his own business, but what came? Temptation. You may be going around, along, minding your own business. Adam and Eve were minding their own business when Satan came to them in the garden. You cannot escape temptation just minding your own business. You have to be ready for it. And she came to him again when he was minding his own business. How many Christians have you heard of who have said, well, it must be God's will he brought us together, talking about two married people. So I'm going to leave my husband, I'm going to leave my wife, and we'll get married. It must be God's will he brought us together. Was it God's will? No way. No way. Don't fool yourself. Okay. Uh, I need to read 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Uh, you don't need to. I have it real clear. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So as David fled, as Joseph fled, the Bible in the New Testament tells us also to flee. 2 Timothy 2.22 says this, Flee the evil desires of youth. Young people hear that. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on God out of a pure heart. Well, coming quickly to the end of the story now, another principle is this. Doing right will not always deliver one from false accusations. See? Had Joseph done anything wrong? No way. But he was still accused, wasn't he? Look here, this Hebrew slave came in to mock me. You brought this guy around the house, now he's mocking us. Here's his coat, he came in here to attack me and and I screamed and so he ran and he left his coat behind. You see, he was here, he was here. So doing right will not deliver one from false accusations. You may be falsely accused sometimes even though you haven't done what's wrong. And doing right will not deliver one from persecution necessarily because Potiphar got angry and he clapped him in iron, put him in the prison where the where he keeps the prisoners but doing right will cause you to prosper because the Lord will be with you. You get that? It won't keep you from temptation. It won't keep you from false accusation. It won't keep you from persecution. But doing right will keep God with you. And he'll bless you and you'll prosper. And everything will run smoothly as it did with Joseph. He, got, he could not fail. <laughs> Everywhere he went, things went right. He was a servant. He was promoted to an assistant. He was promoted to be the household master. He was promoted pro, what? Promoted over the entire state. He was thrown into prison. He was promoted to be the head of the prison so that the head jailer, all he had to do was sit back, put his feet up on the desk, watch the Falcons and the Rams play, on Sunday afternoon, didn't worry about the prison. He knew Joseph had it in hand. That's all he had to do. Because God was with him and blessed him. Doing right will cause you to be trusted by others. Joseph was trusted wherever he went. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful story, isn't it? Our principles important. you got to stick by them. And there are dangers. Lurking, lying wait in front of us. We need to be careful. Because we must say again, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Be sure your sins will find you out. Father, we pray today that you would give us such admiration for Joseph. Help us to feel like brothers with him, that as he has done, we will do. And we will so believe in you and in your rewards that we will be willing to live for you. We think about Moses, too, who... Refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Father, we pray that you'd help us to believe so in what we believe 
that we may turn away from all temptation. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. We go to the Lord's table at this time to celebrate that which the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us.
fact that you're not just interested in grown folks or uh, intellectuals or important people or just poor people or just teenagers, but you also have a special place in your heart for little children and use them as an example as to how we can exercise faith so naturally and trust you. And Lord, we pray that you would bless the children of our church, not only here in church, we thank you for the efforts that have gone forth to minister to children in the nursery and, and uh, cradle roll department, in the beginner, primary, and junior departments, for those who have given their energies week by week to minister to them. We thank you for the children's church that has functioned this entire past year. We thank you for the children's choir that has uh, spoken to the musical needs of our children over this past year. We just thank you for the parents, and we pray, Lord, that you would help parents in their homes. Father, uh, it's a complex and difficult thing to know what to do in every instance. We certainly need the guidance of the scriptures, the practical advice of experience, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to do the very best we can in the rearing of our children. And we pray that for these who are here who still have children, especially small children in the home. Father, we realize the great privilege and responsibility they have to to for these children, the, the very nature of God in their lives. Father, give wisdom, we pray. We also pray that you would be with any needs that may be represented here today, physically or spiritually, and bless this service for Christ's sake. Amen. We move to turn to 225, and let's all stand. <laughs> God to do something. You may be seated.
good group of people here today. And although this is not the most, uh, it's not the time of the year when uh, attendance is the most stable because of comings and goings and holidays and so forth, it's good to see a good group of you here today. We have had some very uh, low days, particularly on the last holiday when we had only 30 in the morning service and our normal attendance is around 60, 65 now. It's increased in the last year a good bit. Glad to see you here. But this is the third Sunday in a row that I've been speaking on the subject of tithing. I expect this subject to last two more weeks, next week and the next. And some of you may say, why in the world would a pastor uh, talk about the subject of tithing for five weeks in a row when he hasn't spoken on it in the first five years that he's been here? Well, I don't know the answer for that except to say that it will take that long to cover the subject the way I'm approaching it. And I want you to understand this subject that we're tithing, giving, is not a, an isolated part of our Christian life. I have discovered that in the in-depth study that I'm trying to do on this subject. Sometimes those things that are done in the early part of a service are called preliminaries, as if they were kind of uh, additions or something leading up to something bigger. It shouldn't be viewed as that. The entire service should be viewed as a whole from the, from the time the prelude is begun all the way until the service is over. And giving to the Lord, as we will see in these messages, is not something that's kind of added on to the main body. It, is, it was in the Jewish economy just about basic to the life of the Jewish nation, and we'll see that. Let me just review for those of you who may have missed the last two weeks. The first thing we saw was that the giving un, of offerings unto the Lord is something that began in the very beginning. Uh, we know that God started it all with the sacrifice of animals to clothe the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And as soon as Adam and Eve and the family were driven out of the garden, Cain and Abel, we believe, following in the step of their parents, began to offer offerings. You remember the story of Cain and Abel's offerings and what happened. It appears as though through the next 1600 years of history we don't know how old Adam and Eve were when they left the garden we don't know exactly what happened through that period of time because it's all covered in about a chapter or two first three chapters of the book of Genesis deal with creation and with Adam and Eve in the garden and by the time we get to chapter six it's all over as far as the world is concerned because the world's destroyed by the flood except for Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives but in between most of that time, people drifted away from God and evidently did not worship him. And if they did not worship him, they probably were not offering offerings unto him or giving gifts. It wasn't until the birth of Seth, sometimes before the flood, that men began to call on the name of the Lord again. And it was Seth that was uh, to take the place of Abel that was killed. But... The very first thing that Noah did when he came out of the ark was to build an altar and to offer sacrifices and to give gifts unto God. So we know that in the first 1,665 years of human history out of the 6,000 that we have recorded, that, there, that offerings began and continued for the most part all the way through Noah. The next personality that comes to the front after Noah was Abraham. And in 1920 B.C., and you know how the years of history go, don't you? We start in B.C. with 4,000 years or 4,004 and we work our way down like the countdowns on Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy all the way down from uh, 4,000 to 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 all the way down to uh, 1 B.C. and then zero hour when Christ was born and then we start to count up instead of down and we're now up to 1,991 years almost closing in on 2,000 years since the birth of Christ. So in 1920 B.C., when Abraham built an altar unto the Lord, no doubt he was sacrificing and giving gifts unto the Lord. It was an indication of his relationship to the Lord. And that's what giving is. Giving and tithing and obeying the Lord. And what he said to the Jewish nation was an indication of their relationship to him. 
And as their relationship was good, it was always in a situation where they were obeying the Lord and giving unto him what he required to be given unto him. So what we're talking about in relationship to giving or to tithing in the history of the Jewish nation, what we're talking about is that God was not concerned so much with rules as he was with relationships. And I think the same thing exists today, that God only has rules in order to establish the right relationship. Rules are not to be followed just just for the sake of rules, but rules are to be followed to bring us into the proper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was 1920 B.C. We hear of offering, building an altar, rather, unto the Lord. We assume he made an offering, but he built an altar. That was the usual sense. And then seven years later, in 1913, before Christ, the first mention in the scriptures of tithing came into effect, as we preached about last week, when Abraham gave gifts unto Melchizedek. He gave tithes. He gave a tithe of all they had unto this priest of the Most High God, whose name was Melchizedek. Then last week we looked into numbers and found out the rules and regulations that God laid down for his people. Through the law, after they had come out of Egypt, hundreds of years later now, 400 and some odd years later, they had come out of Egypt and were in the wilderness, and God says, here's what you do. He said, you bring a tithe of the first and the best of all that you have, and you give that tithe unto the Levites. Last week we told you how that rather than take... See, God always takes... a if you don't like it, that's your problem. But God always takes the first. And why does God take the first and the best from you and from me or from the Israelites historically? Why did he ask for the best? Why didn't he just say, whatever you have left over, bring it, be fine. I know you got your own problems. Uh, why didn't he say, if you have a, a sheep there that's, you know, maybe he's got a bad leg or if he's got a spot or a blemish, bring it. God never said that. God made no excuses. He says, whatever you have, I want the first and I want the best. Why would you think God would require the first and the best from his people in the Old Testament? Because of what Jesus said? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's just a rule. It is a fact that God knew that the only way Israel's heart would be with him was the best. And that was the rule that he laid down for his people. Now, God could have just says, well, it doesn't matter. You know, just do whatever you want to. Do what you can. You know, do your best. What would have happened to the people? They would have wandered. They would have drifted. They would have consumed everything they had upon themselves. They would have become materialistic. They would have become humanistic. They would have become uh, indifferent to a God who treated them that way. But God was a God of authority. He was a God of heaven. And he says, listen, you're mine. You belong to me. You give me the first and the best, and you'll be okay because you'll stay close to me. And when we don't do that, when we do whatever we can or whatever we feel like doing, then our life goes astray and our life goes awry. And in the Old Testament, God had a specific way of doing things. He made no excuses for it. He didn't apologize. He didn't feel like he was imp impinging or infringing on the people's uh, economy or anything like that it was not a, a, a measure it was not a question of uh, whether people wanted to or not or whether they could it was a law it was a rule he said whatever you have whether it's a lot or a little you bring me the first and you bring me the best and you give it to me and then you live on what's left and that's what he said to them he says and if you do he said if you do you'll always have enough and so not only did this extend to their wheat and their barley and their grain and their oil and their figs and their grapes and their lambs and their sheep and their goats and their cattle and everything that they had, but it also referred to their family. And the very first rule, as we said last week, was that the firstborn male of the household belonged to God. And uh, good or bad? Like it or not, that was the way it was. But later he changed the rule and he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. Rather than take the firstborn out of every family, out of the 12 tribes, I'll take one whole tribe. They'll be mine. And they are the Levites. These Levites, they, are, they will not have an inheritance like you. We showed you a map last week where every one of the tribes had a piece of land. On this land, 
they could uh, make their living, they could lay up in store their uh, retirement, they could uh, build homes, they could plant gardens, they could have herds and flocks and vineyards and, and so forth, and they had an inheritance. And God says, as long as you give to me the first and the best uh, tenth of it, uh, you're going to have plenty. But he says, I've got one tribe here of 22,262, no, 22,000 people that are mine. I'm not going to give them any land. I'm not going to give them any goats or sheep. I'm not going to give them any vineyards. They're not going to have anything as an inheritance. But they'll have plenty. And they are going to be mine to minister in the tabernacle and to minister to the things of God, to minister the spiritual things to you. And their inheritance is your tithe. They're to collect tithes from you and live on that. You say, what about them? Well, they're supposed to tithe too. What are they going to do with their tithe? They're going to take the first and the best of everything that you give them in the tithe, and they're going to give it to the Moses, Aaron, and the priest. See, the Levites were helpers. They took care of the tabernacle. They took care of the boards, the sockets, the ropes, the, the tents, all of the things, the firewood and everything they had to have. And the priests and all were the ones who ministered before the Lord in offering sacrifices and representing the people before God. So everybody was taken care of. And he says, this is how it's to be. And it is not to fall down. Today we come to Deuteronomy chapter 12, chapter 14, and chapter 26. And we have time to look at those this morning as the condition, condition of blessing. God said to his people, you're now living in the wilderness. You have no inheritance, but I'm getting you ready for an inheritance. I'm getting you ready for a land of promise. And when you get in the land of promise, this is what you're going to do. This is how it's to be done. So in Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 27, he gives them the condition of his blessing upon them. I think this is the most exciting study that I've done in I don't know how long because it deals not with things. It's not dealing with, with just things or, as I said, rules and regulations. But it is dealing with a system, a, a way in which God's people here in the Old Testament could have a close relationship with God. That's what it's all about. Yeah, we're talking about sheep. We're talking about goats. We're talking about barley and grain and, and all these other things. But all of these things are a means to an end. And the end is this close, personal, blessed relationship with God. You see if it's not true. We begin in 12, verse 5, and it says... But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come, and thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and your heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herd and of your flocks, and there ye shall eat before the Lord your God. And ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your household, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, period. I didn't stop after five. I went five, six, and seven. If you'll look at it, you'll see that that's all one thought. It's all one sentence. They are all interconnected. All the things he said are interconnected within this verse. Now, let me point them out to you. Verse five, he says, to the place where God puts his name, that's where you'll come to. And that's where you'll bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and so forth and so forth. In verse 7. And that's where you'll eat before the Lord. That's where you'll rejoice before the Lord. And you will rejoice in everything in your life. Everything you put your hand to do. Your household and everything else. So you see, what we're looking at right now, listen, is, is not what we're supposed to do. We're looking at what was so that we can build a foundation on finally in the end of this series deciding what we're supposed to do. Forget about that right now. Don't think what you're supposed to do right now, what laws and rules and regulations you're afraid the preacher's going to say we're supposed to tithe or whatever. Forget all of that. We're not talking about that right now. What we're talking about is what was. What was. What happened? How was it in the Old Testament? How are we going to get to know what God really wants us to do? Just pick out an isolated verse here or there and interpret it the way we want to in the New Testament and say, well, this is the rule. 
No, let's try to find out what is the heart of God. What did he do in the past? What was his will then? What was his purposes? How did it work? What did he want from it? What was his, his desire in it all? Just learn that, and we'll draw some con conclusions later. Now, in verse 5 it says, Unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose. What's he talking about? Well, God said, here we are in the wilderness. They're down there below the Dead Sea, wandering around out in the wilderness from place to place in the orderly fashion that we showed you last week with the, uh, with the uh, paper we handed out. He says, but when we get into the land of promise, and you have your inheritance here, and you have your inheritance here, and you here, and you here, I'm going to choose a place where I will put my name. Wherever you are, all you have to do is to know that God's name and God's presence, and you can count on God being there. Now, that's different from today, isn't it? In a way, it's different because God is in all our hearts. But then he was going to put his name and the consciousness of his presence in a certain place so that wherever the Jews were throughout the land of Palestine, across the river Jordan, when they thought about God, they would think about looking toward where God was. See? In the wilderness, they could always look to the center of the camp where he was in the tabernacle. They could see at night the fire glowing over the tabernacle, lighting up the whole camp of three million people. In the daytime, they could see this great cloud hovering above their head, giving them shade by day. And they say, God's there. They knew God was in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle of the wilderness, and they knew where God was. This was their limit, limited perspective to which God stooped in relationship to his presence. Now he said, when I get in the land, I'm going to put my name a certain place. And when I put my name in that certain place, you're supposed to come there and worship. Bring your tithes and your offerings there and worship. Come there and eat and feast and rejoice and thank God for all your life that he's blessed you with. That's what he said. So where did he put his name? Well, all you have to do is think about Daniel, isn't it? For one thing, three times in his wind word, Toward Jerusalem, and he prayed morning, noon, and night. But if you want a specific on that, I won't wait for you to find it, but it's in, it's in Chronicles, and you know the place, Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 16 where it says, For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Who is he talking to? Solomon who built the temple in Jerusalem. And God, after dwelling in the tabernacle through the time of the judges and through the time of Saul and through the time of David, now finally Solomon, after so many years, builds a house and he dedicates it to God. And the Bible tells us that God came into the temple and said, I'll be here. My name is here. My presence is here. My eyes are here. I'm here perpetually. I'm here forever. That was the intention. And so God now saying, years before this happened, he says, wherever I put my name, that's where you come and that's where you worship. That's where you rejoice and that's where you eat and feast and glory in all the things that your hand finds to do. Now we pick up with verse 8. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. What a verse. Do you see that? They're in the wilderness. God is telling them what's going to happen in the future. He says, there's coming a day when you're not going to do like you're doing now. Everybody just doing whatever he thinks is best. I can't help but make a, an application here, if you'll allow me. If there's anything that will destroy your Christian life and destroy a church life, destroy the Christian church, it is this one thing. Everybody doing what's right in his own eyes. I think if there's one curse of the American church, one curse of the American Christian, is that we have this independent tendency, which all Americans have, of independence and thinking we know best. But when you get into the things of the Lord and get into the house of the Lord and get into the church of the Lord, everybody just can't do whatever they think is right. We have to know what God has to say, don't we? We need to know what God says, and we need to do what God says. God said to Israel, he says, there's coming a day when you will not do what you're doing now. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Oh, if we could just get away from this, how many of our ills would be cured.
Verse 9. For ye are not as yet come to the rest. R-E-S-T. Not rest. This means rest, you know. And to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. But when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit. And when, you, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about so that ye dwell in safety. When this happens. Then shall there be a place. What a promise. Then shall there be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. So what?